Bob Coleman and we're talking Main Street and the small business lenders who help it grow. Thank you to this week's sponsor, National Alliance of Commercial Loan Brokers for their event in Miami in October. Last week, we did a webinar on restaurants. The takeaway was there is great disruption within the industry. Listen to this exchange Lance Sexton and I had. Uh, this, this one's a little interesting. Customer traffic, they're saying it's reported increase. I don't know if they do that with online or in, in service. We'll talk about that. But again, uh, there's a lot of appetite for expansion. 75% are going to be talking about, hey, we got to do stuff. And that's what we want to do. Uh, finally, you got to know this stuff. Wholesale food prices continue to go down, which is very important for us. And uh, not only are they going down from the wholesale side, they're also going down on the grocery store side. This is not a C-Store <laughs> webinar, but there's a lot of issues with a lot of competition that are squeezing margins on, on food. Hey, Bob, one of the things about wholesale food prices, guys, a lot of people, the drought in California had a huge impact on wholesale food prices. The hurricanes that go through Florida have a huge price. My sister worked for a company that is a wholesale food distributor throughout the U.S. And, uh, for instance, all their tomatoes were in Florida and got wiped out. So uh, wholesale food prices, there are a lot of things that impact that. Yeah, uh, and we're not, than. yeah, I'm not, I mean, I, we throw out the tariffs. This is not a wholesale food price webinar, but I put this because food is such an important component of these loans. So anything that happens out there, tariffs, hurricanes, um, can certainly negatively impact your cash flow. Uh, and of course, since we are SBA lenders, we need to know how we're doing on employment. And we created uh, 88,000 new jobs in the first half of 2018. So in terms of SBA lending, this meets one of the criteria of, hey, we're doing good things for Main Street. Lance, I'm going to let you comment on this. And um, last year, my takeaway was disruption is coming to the restaurant industry. This year, my takeaway, hey, gang, it's here. What do you think about that? Well, I, th I think that uh, it, the restaurant industry is not immune to online situations. One of the examples, one of my favorite places in the world, Chick-fil-A, just announced that they're going to make ready-to-eat meals that you can pick up at the restaurant. Uh, that's in response to the online services that are doing the same thing. So I think you're exactly right, Bob. The restaurant industry is changing, and, and in order to be effective and competitive, the restaurants are going to have to change. Well, then we're going to talk about that. Uh, what poll question I have used in the following 12 months, you could choose more than one. Uber Eats, Amazon Restaurant, a Grubhub, DoorDash, Blue Apron, or, hey, I pick up the phone or I go online and the restaurant delivers it to me directly. Hey, Bob, my only comment about this, I have a 20-something uh, uh, in the house and a 17-year-old in the house. They use all of those. <laughs> look, oh, look, 100% they've done it. Uh, Uber Eats is, is huge. Amazon Restaurant is going to be huge. All of these type of services are huge. In our ninth annual Restaurant SBA Financing Webinar, we were very specific on training underwriters questions they need to answer about their potential borrower. Why do I ask this? Why we're bringing it up? We have to understand that where we are on the disruption cycle, and I apologize for this messy chart, but for the first time, online deliveries exceed in-store 
experience. So the problem is, and one of the huge takeaways I want to hammer th this, is we all know, or you will learn, that the 67% is the magic number. I can't have labor and food exceed 67%. The problem is online delivery is a separate business model. It's a separate channel. And so one of the first takeaways I want to hammer home is make sure your borrower, your existing customer, your potential customer, understands the financials behind what it takes to run a successful in-store experience and to successfully deliver online. You need you need me to have expertise in both. And just look at the numbers. 2022, um, it's going to be three out of four meals are going to be delivered to our houses. Bob, I'm going to drop off now. When you need me, holler. <laughs> um, here are the online delivery takeaways. Um, only 5% of e-commerce uh, sales are restaurant meals. That's going to increase. And what that means is you're going to have fewer meals served in-house. So think about that a little bit. Uh, we're going to need fewer dining seats, a smaller footprint. So you, you, in, we're talking... We're talking four years. Four years, three out of four meals are going to be delivered. Uh, you're going to have lower margins because you're going to lose that beverage and alcohol sales. And as I said, there are the two business models. However, consumers will continue to use both channels. It's not an either-or situation. All right. Uh, how many times have you purchased prepared meals from a grocery store this year? Go ahead, guys. Let's move it along. There you go. Yeah, once a week, uh, once a month. Um, as Lance mentioned with the Chick-fil-A example, this is going to become more and more prevalent. There are, there are going to be more and more players on this, and I think this is huge. Anything that Amazon touches tends to work out pretty well for Amazon and poorly for Main Street. Um, they're coming out with Amazon restaurants. I saw 14%. It's not on my market yet. I saw 14% do this. Um, they're going to be this, They're going to be huge. Why do I bring up Amazon? Because Amazon is now going to be a direct competitor of your restaurant tour if that restaurant tour isn't signed up with Amazon. So hey, one of the takeaways is you need to understand who they are using on a third party basis or if they're doing it in house. Hey, we get a lot of questions. We appreciate that, Lance and I. Uh, Lance is very, very good at getting answers back to you. I try as well. But we got an interesting question about a refinance of a piece of property where we're missing documentation. From Tobias, it says, I got a call from a broker, but they're going to withdraw the loan because they can't produce evidence for the property improvements of $740,000 that we're going to cash out. They can't, they can't do checks or invoices or nothing, so they're not going to do business with us. What, what are you going to do, Lance? I, I don't think it's such a bad thing that they walk away uh, for Tobias because I can't imagine spending $740,000. Without documentation. And, and not having a check stub or a paid invoice. It's just like last week, Bob, we talked about an accounts receivable aging list where it doesn't identify any customers, and, and I'm not wanting to lend money based on that ARH. Same thing here. Who spends $740,000 and has no evidence? I, I honestly, Tobias, feel like you may have gotten a present by them walking away from this yeah, idea. Don't know. don't be bullied by the, by the broker. It, 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 there are good brokers, and I think this. I agree with you. I would just go see ya. Have a good one. Um, well, I, well, you would not, Tobias, want to be in a liquidation circumstance, having to answer the question of how they spend the seven hundred forty thousand dollars, and you could say, well, they didn't have any. CDC Small Business Finance is the largest CDC in the United States. Not only do they do 504 loans, but obviously they're a community advantage lender and they do 7A lending as well. They have published an excellent, excellent guide about online financing. Listen to the president, Kurt Chilcott, and I discuss this. I'm talking with Kurt Chilcott, president, CEO, of CDC Small Business Finance, Kurt. Uh, you guys just published a great 
book about online lending. First of all, why did you do that? And tell me about what the pitfalls that you are seeing out there in the marketplace. Sure, sure Bob. And thanks for thanks for covering this. We think it's a really important that small businesses are well educated about their choices in financing. And you know, this exists within the SBA world, but also in the larger small business financing world. And uh, so you see small business finance has been engaged in really doing, in addition to our lending, business advising, education of our small business community. And we really felt it was important that small businesses had a great resource they could turn to when they were looking at whether or not it made sense for them uh, to get an online loan. How do you address the, the problem, and I, you and I talk to a lot of different people, when the borrower is faced with the cash crunch and they can get cash in their bank tomorrow, they don't mind paying 50 to 90%. So how do we educate the marketplace that that's not a prudent financial strategy? Yeah, so so we, we don't, uh, you, and, and you know this, we we believe that there are, are is a need for lots of different types of financing out there. And we don't, uh, we actually see that online financing has actually done a lot to wake up uh, um, some of us who are more traditional bank financiers, uh, really, you know, try to look at what our customer experience is, how quickly we can provide financing, because that's really what our small businesses need. So right. the key, key thing for this ebook is that we really give the small business a series of questions that they can ask themselves so they can really make a good informed choice about whether an online loan is right for them or not. And there are certainly some cases where, especially in the short term, that may be their only option, uh, but we want them to do it with their eyes wide open and understanding what they're getting into. Yeah, and and then, then potentially look for a longer term solution after they've gotten out of sort of that emergency cash flow. Yeah. I'm sorry. There's there also, there are definitely small businesses where this type of financing really makes sense for them. Uh, and it may be something uh, in their business that they, that really, it works for them. So I don't want to say it doesn't always work, but just make good informed choices and be educated about what you're getting into. Absolutely. And the restaurant owner, the air conditioning goes out, they got to get it fixed today and they need that 10 grand. Makes perfect sense. They can go do that. But they, certainly they don't, they don't want to be financing <laughs> a huge equipment acquisition, remodel the entire kitchen and repay it over one year. It's going to tank their cash flow and it's not, and that's what you're trying to educate the marketplace. I appreciate that. Um, it's a great ebook. We're going to put the link to it. Kurt, thank you for your time. Kurt Chilcock, CDC Small Business Finance. Thank you so much, Bob. Hey, if you want a copy of that video, check on our website. We have a link to it. As part of our America West interviews, we have Jeff King, RSI and Associates out of Corpus Christi, Texas, business evaluation. Jeff King, Director of Business Development, RSI and Associates, Corpus Christi. Why are you here in Costa Mesa talking to a bunch of SBA lenders, Jeff? Because at RSI, we perform business valuations, feasibility studies for um, SBA loans that are change of ownership loans. We got intangibles over $250,000, and uh, especially when you're dealing with goodwill, you want to make sure you have a good grasp on the value um, before going to the closing table. How long does this this process take when they engage your firm? Yeah, so we actually have about a seven to ten day turnaround on business valuations. So, yeah. Um, and tell me a little bit about do you have different levels of uh, reports that you perform for the lending community? Yeah, uh, at RSI, we typically, you know, we have a couple of stages. One thing that makes us unique is we have something called a uh, sanity check. I love it. I love it. Great. I love and it. And so, with a sanity check, it gives the lender an opportunity to call us at 
pre-screening. Um, if they've got a deal, let's say they've got a restaurant buyer, comes in with an offer of $900,000, that lender's probably wondering if this thing's gonna float, um, whether they can take this to their underwriting you know, committee and, and make sure that uh, you know they get to the closing table with it. And so they get us, the lender, or the, uh, the seller, the buyer, um, our senior appraiser on the phone. We do a conference call, ask the principal of the company a bunch of questions um, about their operations, financials, do a recast of the assets and, and income, income streams, income statement. And uh, by the end of that call, we can give a lender a better idea. Thumbs of, up or thumbs yeah, down. Yeah, thumbs down, you know, and, and this is a good deal. This should move on and we should do a full evaluation. And so it gives them a little more peace of mind putting that thing through underwriting. Uh, footprint. What's that? Footprint uh, nationwide? Nationwide, absolutely. Okay. And we've even done some work in Canada and Mexico. Awesome. Jeff, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining the Common Report Update and for supporting America's Main Street, one entrepreneur at a time.